How we doing, everybody? Welcome to a Monday edition of Flames Nation Live. What's going on? My name is Pat Steinberg. We've got a lot to talk about today. We've got a ton to talk about. We are live in uh, the Sportsnet 960 studios. This is uh, just wrapped up another edition of the big show, and we have got a ton to get to on a Monday edition of Flames Nation Live. Good to see lots of people in on the stream. See that Rob is first in on the uh, on the comments. Start uh, interacting now. We have lots that we can talk about and lots that we can get to over the next little bit. Love your questions. Uh, love your input. Uh, we've got uh, a new signing from the Calgary Flames as they continue to add pieces around the fringes. We're going to get into maybe what the line combinations might look like for the Calgary Flames next year. A couple of your tweets as well. So uh, welcome in to another edition of Flames Nation Live. Mike's in, Rob's in. Uh, start to get your thoughts in and your comments in on the uh, on the side as well on Facebook Live. If you miss it here, we'll have it up on Instagram uh, and on YouTube a little bit later as well. But la- how about we get right into it? The news of the weekend was this. Uh, we uh, were following it all weekend as the newest member of the Calgary Flames is Josh Levo. He signs a one-year deal at $875,000 with the team. And I, uh, I, I I quite like this signing for the Calgary Flames. Um, I, I think that this is a, a really nice middle six depth addition. I think this is a really solid guy uh, from an underlying numbers perspective, from a productivity perspective. This one, unlike the signing of, of Nordstrom or even the signing of Dominic Simone, I think this one shapes up to be a a really solid kind of middle six contributor. And to get that for $875,000 on a one-year contract, I, I quite like this deal for the Calgary Flames. I think that this is a guy that can fit in, and, and if you need to, you can absolutely put him with, with Ryan and, and Nordstrom or something like that on your fourth line. You can absolutely use him as a fourth line player, but because I think we're talking about a guy who has got a little bit more upside than that, and because we're talking about a guy who I think can play further up the lineup, I think it gives you some more options. I think it gives you options as to what you want to do with your middle six forwards. I think it, uh, look, I know that, for instance, the line of Bennett, Lucic, Dubé was outstanding during the postseason in those 10 games during the return to play and and probably for a good chunk. I, I, I think that that was a really nice line, but it doesn't mean that it has to be the line they start next season with. They can come at it from a number of different ways. They don't have to have those those three guys together. And and as Mike says, a right hand shot for Levo, you know, you can put him on the left side, you can put him on the right side, and, and he's got that he's got that one thing that is sorely lacking on the Flames right now, especially in their forward ranks, and that's that right shot. And so I just look at it, and I think that there is a really nice potential to have start have things start to slot in and trickle down properly. So I went over and uh, over in our friends at, at, at Cap Friendly, and I, I started to put together what a, a, a lineup might look like. Now I'm curious as to what you think um, about this lineup. So this is me. This is me, um, and I put this together over at Cap Friendly just before coming on. I, I like the idea of moving Elias Lindholm to the middle and having him on a top shutdown line with Matthew Kachuk and Andrew Mangiapane. That's That's something that I'm really interested in if they don't go in and make a significant addition or significant change to their forward group. This is assuming they come back with Monaghan, with Goudreau, with Backlund, so on and so forth. So I've got Lindholm between Manjapani and Kachuk. I've got Monaghan and Goudreau still together, and I said, well, why not? You can put Dylan Dubé on that line. Because um, I think there's a lot of offensive upside with Dubé, and the way that I see it is that Monaghan Goudreau line would be a very offensively slanted line. You go Michael Backlund in kind of a strict defensive role. Backlund with Levo and Bennett. Not a strict defensive role, but kind of in that that shutdown two-way role. And then a fourth line with Derek Ryan, Milan Lucic, Joachim Nordstrom in what would be a very strict defensive role. I don't mind that. I still think Lucic excels in that type of uh, in that type of role. And then you have Dominic Simone as another option at forward on the blue line with the way things have gone. Anderson Tanev, Nesterov as your right side. 
Jordano, Hannafin, and Valamaki on the left, and then obviously the goaltending takes care of itself. But I'm curious as to what you think about the way those line combinations shape up. So Mike says the team has so many line combination possibilities. It's insane. Love the depth they're getting. And that's true. Like, you don't have to move Lindholm to the middle, but I feel like it's something that they should at the very least explore um, and see if they can make work and see if you can start to turn what I think is the best move for this team going forward. What I think is, is going to be really helpful for this team and what I think could be really helpful for Monaghan and Gaudreau, especially come playoff time is if they can be turned into more of uh, offensive specialists. Like I don't, I don't think the Flames need to, at this point, with guys like Lindholm and Backlund on the roster, I don't think they need to force-feed us Monaghan and Gaudreau in a top-line head-to-head role. Like, turn those guys into offensive specialists. What do they do best? They put up points, they score goals, they generate off the rush, they're offensive catalysts. Monaghan's never going to be confused for a Selkie Trophy winner, I don't think. Gaudreau's never going to be Yuri Lettinen. These guys are offensive first players, so play to their strengths. And by having by having Lindholm and Backlund at center on top of Monaghan, as I go back to him, by having Lindholm at center and by having Backlund at center, it frees up Monaghan, Gaudreau, and I have Dubé there with them. It frees those guys up to get like 70%, 75%, 80% offensive zone start. And you can use Lindholm, Manjapani, Kachuk against the best players on the other side. You can use the backland line as another really good head-to-head line with Levo, who is very good in that role, and Bennett. Maybe you swap Bennett and Dubé on the lines I have there, and then you got some really good fourth line options. I just feel like Turning Monaghan and Gaudreau and turning that line into an offensive first line really helps them, really helps the Flames play to their strengths and then I think really protects them from the areas that they struggle and that is in some of the defensive and and head-to-head shutdown rules that they have been put in or opposing coaches have forced them to be put in. A few of the few of the reactions to those lines that I just threw out there. Pretty good looking lines, Pat. I like Bennett with Monaghan and Gaudreau and Dubé with Backlund. And yeah, you could absolutely do that swap, Rob. You could absolutely go Bennett with with the offensive guys and move Dubé with Backlund. That that could very easily work. Um, this reads from JP. Love Dubé up there. Also love the depth at center. Don't think there's enough dollars to keep Ryan though, and that could very well um, that could very well be the case. Uh, Jesse goes. I like the idea of allowing 13, 23, 28 to be offensive specialists, but who could they use as a reference for comparison when thinking of championship or championship caliber teams in the past 10, 15 years? Um, let me let me give you a good example, Jesse. So, and I, I don't have 28 on that line. I don't have Lindholm on that line. I have Dubé or Bennett on that line. I have Lindholm at center, and I think that's an important piece of the pie. So, I go back to the Vancouver Canucks of the President's Trophy winning era. So, 2010, 2011, 2012, where they had Ryan Kessler as a Selkie Trophy winner and finalist. They had the Sedin line and they had Manny Malhotra. And the way that they structured things was they had the Sedin line, so Daniel Henrik Sedin, and I believe Alex Burroughs for the most part, and they allowed those guys to go like 75, 80, 85% offensive zone starts. Like they were offensive specialists. They had Kessler as the top, and Kessler's line as the top head to head line. Kessler, as much as we hate him in uh, among these parts, as much as you are probably like, uh, Kessler, he was an elite two-way center, like one of the most elite two-way centers in the league. And his line was used kind of in a 45 to 50% offensive zone start role and against the best players on the other side. That was the shutdown head-to-head line. And then Malhotra's line was used in like, well, while the Sedin line was all the way over here offensively and were like 85% offensive zone start, Malhotra was all the way over here at like 7%, 10% offensive zone start, basically all defensive starts. 
And what that allowed Elaine Vigneault and the Vancouver Canucks to do is use the Sedin line as an offensively tailored line play to their strengths. Now, I'm not saying Gaudreau and Monaghan are, are future Hall of Famers like the Sedins are. I'm, I'm not trying to go down that road. But what I'm saying is the Sedins had their best success offensively during that stretch when Vigneault was using them like that. And the Canucks won some President's Trophies. Now, the Flames aren't as deep as those Canucks teams were. And they're, you know, I, I'm not saying it's an exact perfect comparison, but that is a frame of reference as a team that has done it and been championship caliber. I mean, as much as we hate to say it, the Canucks probably should have won the Stanley Cup in 2011, uh, all things considered, at least talent for talent. They didn't, which is awesome. But talent for talent they probably should have so that is a, a frame of reference Jesse as as a way that they could go about doing it doesn't mean necessarily that they will go about doing it that way but I just I feel like there is a potential for them to do that so that's why I'm really interested in the signings that they've made that's why I'm really interested in the way that they have have gone about filling out the back part of this roster because I'll be honest with you like I I think that the forward group, compared to when last season ended in the restart and when next season begins, I actually, because last year I, I had this written down for the big show. So last year, the fourth line in the restart was a combination of Derek Ryan, Mark Jankowski, Tobias Reeder, and Zach Ronaldo. All four of those guys played significant-ish minutes at different times on the fourth line in the 10 restart games. Well, now you're looking at Ryan still there, but you're adding Nordstrom, Levo, Simone as kind of fourth line options. And, and Ronaldo's still signed. Maybe he's in there too. But those are your fourth line options going into next season. I think that's an upgrade on the fourth line, especially if you move Levo up the lineup like you could, and maybe you bring Milan Lucic down and play him in a fourth line role. Now on the blue line, I don't think it's quite the same story, because you're talking about last year when everybody was healthy, it was Jordano Brody, Hannafin, Hamannick, Gustafson, Anderson, Forbort, where you're seven. Now you're talking about Jordano, Anderson, Hannafin, Tanev, Valimaki, Nesterov, and probably Oliver Shillington as your number seven. Um, Rob says, I'm going to assume Shillington is the seventh D. And, and I would think um, I would think that's probably the way it goes. And, and maybe it's a rotation. Maybe Shillington slots in with Nest, uh, in front, instead of Nesterov. Maybe we're talking about uh, Valimaki getting some time off here and there, like it's not a it's not a perfect science, but I would think that yeah, probably you're talking about um, probably you're talking about Shillington as the number seven D for next year or in that mix. Um, so we'll see. Um, Elias says, do you think the coach will finally accept that Gaudreau and Monahan can be the second line? We'll see. I think that there's a potential. I think he even came around to that. Or, or tried it out in, in December and January of last season when he had Lindholm at center for as long as he did. And then Rob says, um, I wasn't a fan of Lindholm back at center, but you really have convinced me. It also lets Monty set in as a number two and backs as a number three. I just think, like, center, doesn't center ice depth win the day in the NHL? And if you can have those options, one through four, Sam Bennett can maybe play down the middle if you need him to. I just think that there is a potential that the Flames are better as a result if they go down that road. I don't know. I mean, it's something worth trying. And the thing is, what I think you're trying to do if you're the Calgary Flames is to set yourself up so that come the playoffs next year, if they get there, you're in a better spot so that everybody can succeed, so that it's not as easy to shut down Gaudreau and Monaghan. And if you've got a full season of... The, the the lines going the way that we've just talked about and guys being used in that way, then it's second nature come playoffs time and maybe Gaudreau and Monaghan can be more effective come playoff time and be more offensively effective and, and impactful come playoff time, which, I mean, I'm writing an article for Flames Nation tomorrow on this. They have not, like, Johnny Gaudreau has zero even strength goals in the last two playoff rounds. 11 games, five against Colorado, six, six against Dallas, zero five-on-five five playoff goals, and, like, only a couple of five-on-five five playoff points. Like, his points per 60 is among the worst on the Calgary Flames. And we're talking about almost 300 minutes of even strength hockey, and Johnny Gaudreau has barely any points five-on-five. Five. 
You need to be able to get more from Gaudreau offensively. Nobody is ever going to convince me that Johnny Gaudreau is not an elite offensive talent. But what you have trouble convincing me of is that Gaudreau can play it both ways and can be a true head-to-head option in this league. Instead, play to his strengths. Monaghan I'm not quite as strong on because I think Monaghan is really working on his two-way game, but I don't think he's ever going to be Kopitar or O'Reilly or Taves or, you know, those those straight-up high-end two-way centers. I, I don't think six seasons in, seven seasons in, I don't think that's what Monaghan's game is. So again, play to their strengths. And Monaghan and Gaudreau are better together, and they're better when they're working offensively. So that's that's kind of what I'm thinking uh, in that regard. Um so what do we uh, what do we have? We've got Liam saying would be interesting to see if Johnny Lindholm and Kachuk could be together. Johnny and Lindholm seem to click pretty well together off the bat, and Kachuk may add that grip that Monaghan doesn't pr- provide. Liam, I believe one year ago today, that was the line that we saw during the Heritage Classic in in Regina. So that was one year ago, October twenty sixth, twenty nineteen. Feels like it was six years ago, but it was really only one year ago, and it was. Lindholm between Gaudreau and Kachuk, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure that's the line that we were talking about uh, for the Heritage Classic. Lindholm scored the only goal for the Flames. I'd be interested in that, but I I, I think that Monaghan and Gaudreau still work better together, personally anyway. Chase says, where does Levo and Simone fit? I, I think Levo fits in a lot of different spots. I think he's probably best used as a middle six guy, middle six winger. Could he be... A top six guy in a pinch if they needed to, probably. Um, but you probably don't want that full time. Um, but that's and, and Simone, I think, is a fourth line option for him and a pretty decent fourth line option for them that can play in that role both ways pretty well. Um, Terry says, in an ideal world, would dropping Lindholm to the third line center help with balanced scoring? Dubé Lindholm would be a great balanced scoring line. It would redistribute the minutes and not burn out the top two lines. I think, and this is just me, but I think there's a real chance that Lindholm could be the answer to Calgary's number one center. I, I'm not guaranteeing it because I don't know for sure, but I think there's a chance that Elias Lindholm could be this team's answer to the number one center that they've been lacking since when, Joe Neuendijk. So I, I think there's a chance that that could be Lindholm. And that's why... I think moving him to the middle long term is something this team really needs to establish. So I like the concept, Terry. Personally, for me, and in my opinion, I would have Lindholm as the number one guy as opposed to the number three. But I think that we're we're working on on the same idea of how to better distribute all of their forwards and their depth. Uh, Jesse, has Gaudreau's perceived value around the league plummeted as a result of poor playoff performances? And as such, is it possible they're past the point of optimal return in the player prior to walking him to UFA? It's a fair question. I still think that Gaudreau has plenty of trade value if they... um, if they want to go there. Um, and I think there would be plenty of teams that could say, okay, we could turn this guy into what, what we think he could be. It's not as high as probably it was coming off a 99 point season, but you, I mean, you weren't trading him last off season, even after the Colorado disappointment after another playoff disappointment. Yeah. Is it as high as it could be? Maybe not, but I still think it's high. I still think if you wanted to, you could get a really good return for them. It's uh, Flames Nation Live. Great uh, great contributions on Facebook Live with us right now. You can always get your comments in. We also ask for, uh, earlier in the day, we always ask for some thoughts on Twitter. And uh, here is... Here is one of our questions on Twitter uh, from today. Uh, This one says, could you see Backlund being moved for a right-wing top six like Palmieri, therefore allowing Lindholm to move to the second line center position? Again, I mean... For me, I think I, I think Lindholm is the number one center and Monaghan is the number two is the way you go. I don't like the idea of moving a guy like Backlund just because... I think he is he 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 does something that at least on right now on this team nobody else does. Nobody shuts down opposing teams better than Michael Backlund does and his line. And really to this point, friends, is there a player on this team that 
elevates players around him better than Backlund? Like, name a guy. Lance Boma, Joe Colburn, Andrew Mangiapane, Sam Bennett. You get put on Backlund's line, you get elevated. And now you get put on Matthew Kachuk and Backlund's line, and the duo, you get elevated. Now, that's not. I'm not trying to take anything away from Mangiapane, who I think is a hell of a hockey player, too. I, I think Mangiapane is a compliment to that line on top of being elevated by that line. And they all play into it one another. But... Like back the backland bumps a real thing. He makes guys around him better. I'm not ready to trade him unless I'm getting my socks knocked off. Um, but and and as uh, Liam says, I think blasphemy is the word you used when I brought up backland before. Yes, it is blasphemy, Liam. I wouldn't do it. I mean, again, if it's something that is is a can't miss, well, I think anything's on the table. I don't think I would say at this point that we're talking about completely untouchable, but uh, I don't know how many guys really are outside of 19, 28, maybe now Valimaki. I don't know. There's not a lot of untouchable guys on this roster. Um, but no, I would not be eager to be trading Backlund myself. Um, Nathaniel writes, where do you see Nesterov slotting in? I think probably, I mean, Brad Treliving uh, talked about it over the weekend even going back to Friday when they signed Nesterov, right now, probably is your third pairing right side defenseman. Right now, he's probably playing with Valimaki on the left side of, of the third pairing. That's probably a decent place to slot him in right now. Not a guarantee, but they kind of look at him and his versatility. He is a left shot, but played a lot on the right. Um, and so I think that we're, we're probably talking about that if you pencil it in right now. Of course, we don't know what the rest of this roster is going to look like, but that is um, probably what we're talking about. Joseph says, D pairs I'd want to see. Hannafin, Anderson, Valimaki, Tanev, uh, Tanev, Gir- Giordano, Nesterov. I mean, I don't think of those six guys, Joseph, I don't think you're you're really going wrong Tanev playing with Valimaki, maybe it's a similar fit to Tanev playing with Hughes. Valimaki and, and Hughes are very different players. I, I understand that, but same type of concept, knowing how steadying people say Tanev was playing with Hughes in Vancouver last year. That absolutely is a way that you could go if if they wanted to mix it up a little bit. Um couple of other a uh, couple of other the uh, on the comments before we start to wrap things up uh, Jesse says I still don't understand why they haven't tried a 13 11 28 line at length I'd also shift Monahan to the wing but I'm weird um JP, Backlund's a center, ideally third line, but has contributed extremely well on the second line. Uh, Elias writes, do the Flames have to make a move to fit in under the salary cap? Shillington still needs to be signed. Um, and and I, they could sign Shillington and be under the salary cap, it looks like, but it would be tight. Like, we're talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of breathing room. Uh, that's probably what we're talking about when it comes to the, the Flames and the salary cap. It, once they sign Shillington, I think that's probably going to be a year, eight hundred seventy-five, eight hundred fifty, eight hundred thousand, something like that. Is is my guess as to what it's going to look like when it's all said and done? Um, Derek says I'd put Tanev with Shillington. Problem is I don't know if Shillington is penciled in as a top six guy every single night. Uh, JP with a big time. With the current lineup, who gets protected for the expansion draft? JP, table that one. We will we'll we'll tackle that one. That's a that's a Pike and Steinberg one because Pike's got Pike's such a CBA genius that you need him for all the nuances and minutia of the of the thing. And finally, Josh, the whole problem has always been they haven't been constructed for the playoffs. In a one off regular season game, Flames are usually good, but come playoffs, any other team knows shut down the first line and it's a cakewalk. Separating the boys on different lines would really change how the other team has to game plan against them come playoffs and they'd be far more dangerous bang on Josh that's exactly what I'm talking about that's why I'm talking about moving Monaghan and Gaudreau to uh, a different type of role moving Lindholm to center on a different line moving Backlund maybe away from Kachuk spread it out make yourself more difficult to match up against that's the concept that I'm fascinated about and fascinated with We'll see what the Flames do when we come January, when we get to January, rather, uh, when we expect this whole thing to get going. Great stuff. Uh, another great edition of Flames Nation Live in the books. Thanks for everybody for stopping by live. You can always get us. We usually do them Mondays and Fridays at 6 o'clock Calgary time on Facebook Live, but then always archived on Flames Nation's Facebook, on Flames Nation's Instagram, and uh, on YouTube as well. You can get us on Instagram. 
Nation underscore FN, official Flames Nation on Facebook and at Flames Nation on Twitter. Uh, pop me a follow if you want on Instagram, Steinberg1984, or uh, at Fan960 Steinberg on Twitter. Big show tomorrow. We're going to have Josh Levo on the program. Josh Levo is going to join the big show tomorrow at 3 o'clock. The newest member of the Calgary Flames should have Brad Tree Living on the program a little bit later on with us this week, too. Uh, big show goes from 1 till 6 o'clock every weekday on Sportsnet 960. The fan, check out flamesnation.ca. I've got something for you tomorrow about the forward groups and shifting things around similar to what we just talked about. Pike and Mike are uh, putting things out on a regular basis as well at flamesnation.ca. Have yourself a wonderful Monday. It's much nicer in the city of Calgary. Hopefully you're enjoying the much nicer weather. Uh, we will talk to you later on this week. Be well, everybody. Stay safe, and thanks for stopping by once again. We'll talk to you later this week on Flames Nation.